In my last video, I took you on an in-depth tour of my video podcast studio you see here. But in this video, we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into all the gear and equipment that you're going to need, along with all the setup that is required for you to have your own high quality, live stream capable video podcast studio, starting with cameras. So as of this recording, I use three different cameras in my live streams. There's the GoPro Hero 7, which I use as kind of a behind the scenes wide shot. There's the Sony RX100 Mark V, which is a point and shoot. I use that as an overhead shot. And then there's the Sony a6500 here, which is kind of my main camera angle. Now, of course, you're not limited to only these cameras here, but there are some features that you need to keep in mind when you're purchasing cameras for your own podcast studio. And the main feature that you wanna look for is that the camera has the ability to output a clean HDMI signal. And what that means is that your camera can output a clean video feed without any of the overlays you will sometimes see on the back of a camera like you do here. And that's important because with the way that this podcast studio is set up, all of my video is being recorded into the computer rather than into the camera. And that's helpful because it means that I don't have to worry about any recording limits that you'll experience on some of these mirrorless and DSLR cameras. And I don't have to worry about any battery life issues. Now, of course, how you set up your camera to output a clean HDMI signal will vary depending on the camera that you have. But if you happen to have the Sony a6500, all you need to do is go into the menu, go to the toolbar icon, page number four, click on HDMI settings, and then you wanna just make sure that you turn HDMI info display off. You also wanna look through the menu to make sure that there are no settings that will prevent your camera from staying on during the course of the live stream. Last thing you want is for your camera to just turn off in the middle of it because it's got some sort of timer on it. Now, in the case of the Sony a6500, as long as I have it plugged into some sort of external power source, which I do via this micro USB to USB cable, I don't have to worry about the camera turning off randomly. Next thing you want to do is determine the resolution and frame rate you intend to be filming at during your live streams. In my case, I actually set my camera to 4K and export that 4K video signal into the computer and downscale it to 1080 from there. The reason that I do that is that uh, it just adds a little bit of extra sharpness. I find that the 1080 on the Sony a6500 is pretty soft. So I find that if I output that 4K video feed, the resulting picture is much, much sharper. As far as frame rates go, I always shoot at 24 frames per second. That's just kind of the cinematic frame rate that uh, people kind of default to. Uh, 30 frames per second is gonna give you more of a newscast slash home video look. Anything more than that is just gonna be overkill. For example, I wouldn't suggest setting your frame rate to 60 frames per second. That's just gonna be too taxing on your system and your internet connection. Now, there are a couple different accessories that you're going to need to make this work correctly. Uh, for example, uh, you're going to need some sort of external power supply. I use a micro USB cable, as I mentioned earlier. This allows me to plug it into some sort of USB charger and power the camera externally. A lot of cameras also offer external battery adapter things. Basically, it's a battery that replaces the existing battery in the camera, but it has a cable connected to it that you can plug into any power outlet and that'll power for as long as you need. And then to get the video signal out of the camera, you're going to need an HDMI cable. Now, in the case of the A6500, it uses a micro HDMI to HDMI cable, but be sure to check your camera's manual because the cable that your camera requires may be a little bit different than the A6500. Now, you may be tempted to try to save a little bit of money and go for something like a webcam instead of a mirrorless or DSLR camera, but I would advise against that because as I mentioned in the intro of this video, we're going for quality here. And most webcams that you can buy are just not gonna give you the quality that you want. So if quality is your concern, stay away from the webcams. And I think that'll do it as far as cameras are concerned. Now let's talk about how to get the video signal out of the camera and into the computer. Now, in order to get the video signal from your camera into your computer, you're going to need some kind of what's called a capture card, or in this case, a live stream switcher board like this. This is the Blackmagic Ada Mini live stream switcher board. And if you're planning to go with more than one camera angle for your live stream podcast studio, I would recommend something like this. It's only $300 and it allows you to input up to four HDMI inputs in the back of it, and you can live switch through them in real time during your live streams. It also offers options for chroma keying if you do anything with green screens. It's got some different transitions you can play with, hard cuts versus crossfades. And it also offers picture in picture functionality, which is just what it sounds like. It basically allows you to layer videos on top of each other. Setting up the Ada Mini is super simple as well. You just plug in the HDMI cable that comes out of your camera. It's got a power cable that plugs directly into any power outlet 
it. And it's got a USB-C connector, which will get plugged into your Mac or PC. Now let's say you only plan to use one camera angle during your live streams, in which case this might be a little bit of overkill for you. In that case, I might recommend something like this. This is the Camlink 4K capture card. At the time of this video, this Camlink 4K is only about $123 on Amazon. It allows you, as the name implies, to output up to 4K video resolutions. All you need to do is plug the HDMI cable from your computer into this side of the capture card. The USB side gets plugged into your Mac or PC. And just like that, you've got a video signal from your camera into your computer. Now, one thing to consider if you do plan on going with a capture card like this, if you ever plan to add any additional camera angles to your setup, you're going to have to purchase an additional one of these. You need one of these per camera that you have in your setup. And at a price of $123 each, by the time you surpass two camera angles, you're better off just getting something like this switcher board anyway, because it's only 300 bucks. And ultimately you'll be saving money and you'll have the ability to cut between your different camera angles live during your live streams. So let's recap. We've got our cameras outputting a clean HDMI signal into a capture card or an Ada mini switcher board like this one. And then that live switcher or capture card is being plugged into your Mac or PC. So now we have a live video feed going in to your computer. So now let's move on and talk about audio. As far as audio goes, goes, if you have the budget for it, I would suggest going with an XLR microphone and a USB audio interface setup. By the way, XLR refers to the cable type that connects the microphone to your audio interface. This is the Audio-Technica AT2035. It's a relatively inexpensive XLR microphone. It's got a low pass filter built into it. Sturdy, nice and reliable. I have this microphone plugged into the Rodecaster Pro podcast production console, as it's called by Rode. Now you don't need to spend $600 on an audio interface. Interface. In fact, if you saw my last video, you'll know that I had a different audio face at that point. That was this guy here, the Behringer UMC202 HD audio interface. This is a two channel audio interface and it works just fine and it's much less expensive. But the great thing about the Rodecaster Pro is that it does allow you to plug in up to four XLR inputs. Uh, you can adjust the levels on the fly for each of those. It has a soundboard so you can plug in some sound effects and things like that. And it's got four headphone outputs. So if you have up to four people on your podcast, everyone can be listening and monitoring their own audio. Setting up your audio interface is also super simple. All you have to do is plug in one end of the XLR cable into your microphone. The other end will go into the XLR input of the audio interface. Typically it'll have some sort of power source that you would plug into any standard power outlet. Also it'll have a outbound USB port which will allow you to plug it into your Mac or PC. Now if you're on a bit of a budget you can technically use the audio directly out of the camera but the thing with most DSLR and mirrorless cameras is that the in-body audio is just crap. It's not very good at all. So in that case you'll definitely want to have some kind of shotgun microphone or other audio solution that you can plug into your camera. For example the Rode VideoMic Pro would be a good option or if you want to go super cheap you could do something like the Rode Video Micro which is only about 50 bucks but just keep in mind that you get what you pay for so if quality is your goal this is the way to go. Plus, if you have an audio interface of some kind, it makes it much easier to be able to monitor and control the audio in real time. All right, audio check. Next, let's talk about lighting. Now, again, we're talking quality here. So unless you're in a room that's got some nice, consistent, flattering lighting at all times, you're going to want some sort of external light source. This is the video light that I use. It's the Godox SL60W, and on it, I have a 36-inch softbox. The reason I like this light so much, there's actually a few reasons. Number one, it's not that expensive. It's only about $135 plus another $65 if you want this nice big 36 inch softbox. And number two, it produces a very high quality, very diffused light. You can also adjust the color temperature and the intensity of the light to suit your needs and your style. And because the light is so diffused, you don't have to worry about it casting a bunch of shadows, let's say, if your microphone is in front of it. Now, if you're on a budget, you can do something like maybe using one of those cheaper LED light panels. I've used things like those in the past. The problem with those is that they don't diffuse the light very well. So you do run the risk of getting some shadows introduced into your video, or you may also experience some glares and things like that off of your skin. Let's say if you tend to sweat a little bit, you'll notice some hot spots on your face. Now at this point, you've got all your cameras, your microphones, etc. but there are some accessories you'll want to look into to ensure that you can position everything where you want it to be. For example, you may wanna consider getting a tripod for your camera or cameras. You don't need to spend a ton of money on a tripod, but you do 
want to ensure that the tripod is sturdy enough to be able to hold the weight of your camera. Another option if you have a desk and shelves like I do here is friction arms. For example, my Sony a6500 is sitting on a quick release plate, which I have attached to a Manfrotto friction arm and it clamps right onto my desk. Super sturdy, works great. And then my RX100 Mark V up here actually clamps onto this shelf using a mini friction arm. For your microphone, I would recommend some kind of desktop mic stand or a boom arm like this one. I love this boom arm because I can just move the microphone around wherever I want it to. I wouldn't recommend holding the microphone for the duration of your live stream as that hand motion and kind of moving the mic around can create some unwanted noise. Now at this point, you should have everything that you need as far as gear it's concerned for your podcast studio, but there are some other optional accessories you may want to consider uh, that can help with your workflow and just kind of upping your production value. For example, the Elgato Stream Deck here is a cool little device. It's got 15 customizable buttons. You can integrate it with OBS, AKA Open Broadcaster Software, which we will talk about in in the next video of this series. I also use it occasionally as a soundboard. I use it to switch back and forth between my camera angles and my screen. And if you're not using a live switcher like the Ada Mini, you can also use the Stream Deck to go back and forth between your various camera angles. Another thing you may want to consider is a field monitor, and this can serve a couple different purposes depending on your needs. For example, if your camera doesn't have a flip out screen, much like the a6500, a field monitor can help with framing and just making sure that everything looks good in the frame. But if you do end up buying a monitor, you want to make sure that it has an HDMI input and an output. If your field monitor doesn't have an HDMI output, then you're only going to be able to use it as a reference monitor and you're not going to be able to output that signal from the monitor into your capture card. Another use for certain field monitors is external recording capabilities. For example, say you don't want to record all of your video footage into your computer, or maybe you want to record all of your different camera angles separately. Using a field monitor like the Atomos Ninja 5 will allow you to record directly into the field monitor so you don't have to use up your computer's bandwidth recording into your your computer. But just keep in mind, if you do want to go down that route, those field monitors are a lot more pricey and there's a bit of a learning curve to figure out how to use them. One last optional accessory that I need to mention, and it's not really an accessory, uh, is having someone else to help you. Now, I'm pretty familiar with all this equipment here, but if you've ever watched any of my live podcasts, you'll know that even I have some hiccups. Of course the intro wouldn't work. Why would the intro work? We're getting some glitchiness. Oh shoot, I just realized you couldn't hear me for the last... 10 or 15 seconds. It's a lot to keep control of as you're doing your live streams. So if you have someone else with you who can just be keeping an eye on all this stuff and take that off of you, it may make your job as the host much easier. Now, the one thing we haven't talked about, which is a critical component to all of this, is your computer. Now, I'm not gonna pretend to be all knowing when it comes to PC specs and all that, but I do know that the computer is doing an awful lot when you're recording and streaming. So you're gonna need some sort of system that can handle all of it. The system I'm using features a GTX 1080 graphics card. I have 32 gigabytes of RAM. I've got a Ryzen 7 3700X CPU, and all these things together seem to handle the workload pretty effectively. And you could probably get away with less, but I don't know exactly what you need. I just know that what I have works. <laughs> and I say all that just to let you know that if you're rocking an old system with outdated components, it may be time for an upgrade if you want to do this effectively and with high quality. All right, and if you followed all the steps and guidelines that I've outlined in this video, you should be all set to move on to the next step, which is setting up all the software that you're gonna need to do your live stream. But this video is already long enough as it is, so we're gonna be covering that in another video in the future. But until then, leave any questions that you have in the comments below, and I'll do my best to respond to all of them, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.